All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another series of the of design nuances edu series by TQ Labs. And the objective of the series is for you to learn a new um, area or a nuance in the topic specific to design, fashion, or architecture, or it could be a general topic as well. Um, you get to interact with an expert and absorb the knowledge that they share about this topic. Also, you get introduced to a new school and understand the purpose of why that school exists. Um, today, we have Professor Sudhakar Damodar Swami, who is a professor of practice representing the School of Design and Innovation at RV University. Uh, he'll be talking about design thinking, doing, and learning. You know, this is one of our favorite topics um, as, as DQ Labs. It's one of the most important aspects that we think is important to spread so people understand and, and you know, really absorb this information. A little bit about Professor Sudhakar. Um, he's completed his education at NID in 1990. He's had wonderful positions in the past as the head of experience design for Infosys. He's been the principal designer for Vispala Technologies. Professor Sudhakar teaches at the School of Design. Um, of RV University, Design and Innovation at RV University, Bangalore. He's, uh, he's have, he has 30 years of experience in, in experience design, and he loves to evangelize the use of design principles, learning by intense exploration and seeking value at the end goal of design. He's developed a number of frameworks that attempt to enhance the idea of design and its role in the world. Um, he likes to read a lot, grow green things, and dive and dive down the exploratory rabbit hole of whatever is new in technology. Um, Professor, uh, before we, we, we get to your stage, uh, a small announcement for those who are here. If you're interested in understanding more about RV University's School of Design. Uh, you can go on to DQ Edge. They are listed there. Uh, the application link is not out yet, but in case you need any clarifications at the end of this, Rima from, uh, from RV University's admissions team is here to help you out. Professor Sudhakar, over to you. Thank you so much for coming in here today. Um, Right, right. So pleasure having you, and looking forward to seeing what you have. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, thrilled to be here as well, and uh, nothing better than talking to you know uh, aspiring designers and uh, revealing to them some aspect of the fan of uh, the fascination with design that we all have as designers, right? Absolutely. So let me uh, share my screen. Sure. So so uh, you will be taking your part of the topic for a little while, and then we'll go into the Q Q and A. Yeah, right. that's right. That's right. Okay. So it should take more than about 25 minutes, my uh, presentation itself. And post that. Uh... Well. I hope the screen's visible and everybody can see this. Yes, it's visible, yeah. So uh, today I'm gonna to talk about, uh, like Dion mentioned, uh, design and you know, uh, the doing, thinking, learning. And uh, there, is a, uh, there is a reason why it is in that order, which, we, which will become apparent as I keep uh, talking. So what I'm gonna to talk today is uh, about design in a generic sense not very specific to my discipline, my, dis my uh, area of expertise, which is experience design, uh, but gen discipline, I mean, design as a generic discipline, right? So because we believe, we believe that we are all designers first, and then whatever designers we are, product design, communication designers, or user experience designers, that comes later. 
But even before we specialize and start practicing in some area of interest, we're all designers first. And there is a generic set of principles, a generic set of skills, generic set of sensibilities that we all learn. And uh, which make us, you know, what we are as essentially as designers. So I'm going to go through a number of uh, principles, uh, learning objectives, things that you encounter in a design school in a way. And uh, so this is what each screen will look like. I just want to explain how I've organized the screen. So for your use later, even after I finish this presentation, you'll find that, you know, there's a topic on the top right hand corner, which is basically what I'm talking about with this uh, slide. And below that, you, I've given a link. And that link is going to be very useful for you all. So just uh, notice that there is a link there as well. So one of the first things you do when you join design school is that you will start learning to draw. And if you know how to draw, you're probably relearning to draw. So if you look at this drawing here, would you say it's a good drawing? Common measures of drawing probably say that, no, I mean, this, this looks like squiggles, right? But to me, it is a good, it is at least symptom of a good drawing. Because beyond drawing, we're looking for something more than drawing itself, you know, which is to do train your hand, train your eye, train to look. And the hand converts what you see and captures what you see, right? That's the essence of drawing. And for me, this is a good drawing because the lines are fluid, and it's capturing the essence, the essence. All drawing is an abstraction, right? And then the essence here is the volume, right? It's a human figures that is being tried, uh, that the, you know, the person who's drawn this is captured. So what has been captured is the essence of the human figure, the massing of the human figure, the fluidity of the human figure. Because human figure is very organic. We're all muscles and bones and, you know, volumes of that nature. Right? So how do you capture that in a, through the quality of a line? Otherwise, it's, you know, you'll see a lot of drawings which look very wooden and you know, very unhuman-like or unliving like So you learn the quality of line, you explore, you know, because there are millions of ways you can express just with the quality of a line itself. So you spend a lot of time doing this when you come to design school, and it's important for many reasons. One of them is that you actually tra train your eye and you train your hand and you're training your brain in the whole process. And you're training a whole coordinated aspect of all three of these faculties that we possess. And you, then you will proceed with drawing some more where you start observing. We always draw from real life. We don't copy other drawings, right? We always draw from real life because you know, you're training your eye to see, see into this three dimensional space. And we also train, we train to see the details. We train to see transitions, we train to see gradations, shadows, edges of things. How do you represent the edge of something, you know, like a leaf? And how would you represent a very specific leaf, a particular leaf with its own characteristic tactility, right, through a line? So you observe and you get close, okay? So you see, you see first and then you observe and then you get close. And, you know, to cultivate our ability to observe is probably the keenest ability that a designer needs, uh, next to curiosity. First you observe and then curious. But you need to observe. And you know that we have, a key, we sharpen our ability to observe itself. And this is something that, you know, serves us and makes us in a way special because we learn to observe better. So this is the second thing that you will learn. And then you would move on to learning a lot of principles, the first principles of design, elements of design. And then, you know, what do you do with the elements of design? The elements of design are basic, right? It's just a dot, it's a line, it's a shape. This is the main fundamental elements that we play around with to create what we create. But how do we use these elements? There are some principles, which I've shown on the right side. So you learn to play around with these elements, or at least understand these elements, how to use, how to create harmony, for instance, how to express through something as abstract or very simple and fundamental as a line. How do you express harmony in a picture? How do you create balance with just a set of lines? 
how do you actually transpose what is three dimensional, you know, stereoscopic in what we see every day? How do you transpose that into the two dimensional plane, but yet, yet simulate everything that we see in the three dimensional? How do you make this translation? And do you, do you really see the wonder of it all? Making the, the ability to make this translation itself is so beautiful, isn't it? And I said two-dimensional plane, and the two-dimensional plane is, for us designers, it's space. You know, because through two-dimensional space, you can never express three-dimensional space. You can never express four dimensions. You can never express the dimension of time, like in a comic book, for instance, right? So how do you understand that space? How do you explore that space? So given here an example of an artist called Mondrian, who explored that very, very intensively. All his life, he just started abstracting what he saw into, you know, a set of um, perpendicular lines some parallel lines, vertical, horizontal. And with that, he tried to capture the essence of what he was seeing. He spent his whole life dedicated to the subject and we owe him a lot. We learn from what he learned. And uh, we learn the idea of space as well, the two dimensional space. And how to appropriate the space to do what we want. Because whatever we do, even if we're doing, let's say, a space, an interior space, a product, a car, something three dimensional, we still always originate our ideas in a two dimensional space. So it's important, and that's our toolkit, and that is where you know all our ideas are born. So this two-dimensional space becomes very important. So this is the fourth thing that you know I would emphasize, uh, and that is what something that you will learn in advanced group. And the fifth thing that you will learn is the nature of material. I use the word getting close, right, to something that you observe. So again, with material, you get close but not with your eyes alone, but also with your hands. So you take an element like, again, a line, which is now, you know, simulated through the use of a wire. And now how do you articulate this wire in space, now in three dimensional space, right? How do you articulate a two dimensional plane like paper in three dimensional space? How do you combine a two-dimensional kind of you know material with you know a unidimensional material like a wire. How do you play around with three-dimensional material? And how do you play with material itself? How do you cut? How does a material cut? How does a material fold? How do you create stiffness? How does how does a material bend? At what point will it stand and beyond which it will collapse? How can you balance and you know? make something stand with its own integrity. So you get close to a material mix. And it's very, very necessary for us designers that we understand the nature of material. Even in the virtual world, like, you know, I do use experience design and most of my work is in digital screens. But this materiality is something that we refer to even in the two dimension screen. Because, you know, we're trying to simulate paper sometimes. We're trying to simulate certain structures. Um, express the idea of texture uh, even in a digital screen, right, sometimes. So we really have to understand material and this is very fundamental for us designers. And this is the fifth thing that you will learn as a high priority item in the landscape. Having mastered, I think, some very, very basic skills and sensibilities and some very basic notions of what, you know, the world around us is made up of. Then we start to use, appropriate these things to express, to create meaning. And we use metaphors, right? The language of visual expression to kind of communicate. Do you notice the baby on the left? And it is a baby. You know, there's no, no, everybody knows it's a baby, right? See how the negative space has been used to kind of imply a diet. Can you look at the legs and see the thigh is thicker and then, you know, the lower leg is thinner. And then, you know, you can almost see the, lay, it, the the baby is almost alive. It's on its back, it's wiggling its legs. How do you bring such expressiveness using some very basic forms? Because all you see here is rectangles and circles, essentially. 
and we were in a triangle, one triangle was there, it's the negative triangle. And we've used that and you know created something so essential and so communicative and so iconic. On the right side, you see this very interesting poster for a movie called Coffee and Cigarettes. How again negative space is being used to kind of imply, and you know, everything is coming together into a certain harmony, and it's expressive and it's uh, interesting. So you will learn that, you know, having learned the basic, you know, elements that you're playing with, how do you appropriate them and use them to express? Because expression again is you know fundamental to design. Whichever field you belong to, you know, you end up, you are always expressing. And mostly you're expressing something that is uh, original to you, as well as, you know, something that is you know, belongs to the world. You again, we still, we are still residing in this area of two dimensions, two dimensional space and appropriating the space to express. Uh, here you learn again, something called tessellations. How do you create patterns? How do you create rhythm? How do you create metamorphosis from one thing to another? This is the work of a very famous artist called uh, M.C. Escher. So that's why these links are very important, okay? I mean, the links will kind of take you and you know make you understand all these things much better. And you will have a lot of uh, fun uh, going through these links. I spent a lot of time curating these links, so please do visit these links. So you do learn to do create patterns and metamorphosis and space and form and you know structuring space and all that you do learn. That's another beautiful, wonderful thing that you're learning in design school. See, all the time, you know, you're also changing your own neural pathways. Okay, it's not just learning a skill uh, in a very at a conscious level. Your brain itself is being modified. You know, we become more visual in our thinking. Uh, visual in the way we observe and consolidate and form opinions and construct ideas of what we're seeing. So it starts becoming more and more visual as, as we progress learning these, you know, um, visual uh, modalities of uh, expression. Then we move on to, you know, processes. Design is Design is a discipline, but design is also a process. Design is also an outcome because, you know, finally we say that design is good. Then you say, oh, that, that's an outcome of some activity, right? Someone that did something and now it is good and return, it has been improved. So, but design is also a process to design. We would then, let's go design, we say that, right? So it's also a process. So, and this process is very important for us. And this process is unique to us. And it is so wonderful and it is so, uh, we, we can do some wonderful things, some amazing things with that. Now, everybody else is paying attention to this process and everybody wants to learn at least bits and pieces of this process. And this process is very, very important for us. How do we start with, you know, let's say abroad, sometimes a problem area, someone says, you know, hey, there's a problem, can you fix it? You start and observe the problem. And then you eventually fix it creatively and, you know, interestingly, right? And beautifully, always beautiful. So how do you go? What is the journey of, you know, solving a problem? There is a process to it. And this is a process that you will repeatedly learn in design school. In very, very different contexts, you will start with solving something very simple and basic and you, you know, progress on to solving something, you know, complex and, you know, and complexer as you go from, you know, year to year. So this, this process is always reinforced. It is not a very structured process. It is not a very prescriptive process like you find in engineering, right? You apply this formula, you get a solution. This is something we have to cultivate. And all of us would kind of, you know, appropriate this process and create nuances of, you know, how we would, we would adapt to, you know, the way we work, our own characteristics of, you know, thinking and, you know, our own temperaments, we will adapt this process. So it's not prescriptive. So we understand it very internally, but there are definite stages, there are definite techniques. And over and beyond that, you learn to think in so many ways. Like you see, the, all the call outs that you see here, divergent thinking, convergent thinking, integrative thinking, abductive reasoning. So these are things that we cultivate as second nature. This is, this is an attitude more than, you know, apart from thinking skills, it's also a thinking attitude, how we approach the world. That's what sets designers apart and makes us unique. 
So you learn, you learn a number of design thinking. These are all very futuristic thinking skills, right? So, you know, these are the, these are the skills that, you know, people say that in, in future, you know, anybody who wants to work and create something new and innovate and all needs to have these skills. And for design, it is very, very fundamental. So this is, this is going to give you a huge edge uh, in the world, in, in other multidisciplinary settings, right? You're working with engineers, you're working with management people, but we have a very specific skill set. We, are, we have the ability to think in very specific ways, which is unique to us. And that is emphasized uh, during this, uh, this learning, uh, this, during the process of learning the design process. We also learn to synthesize. And when I say synthesize, synthesize is, you can treat synthesis as an opposite of analysis. Analysis, you're breaking up things. Whereas in synthesis, you're trying to bring things together into you know, some sort of pattern and framework and a structure and a unity. So we excel in synthesis. Again, we excel in synthesis because we do it visually. And to do it visually is very easy for us. And uh, we have an edge there again. So the, to, the ability to synthesize is learned during the you know, learning of the design process and some of the methods that you use during the design process, you will learn how to synthesize. For example, here you see a mind map. Uh, please go to the link and study how to make a mind map because a mind map not only allows you to kind of synthesize, but it also trains your brain to, you know, think more creatively, organize things better, to kind of, you know, connect very, very distinct, seemingly distant things to connect. That's called integrative thinking. So, you know, it allows you to do that. So synthesis is, I think, one of our strong points and that you will learn throughout, you know, your journey in design school. You will also learn to make sense of large amounts of data that you will yourself collect. So, it's, you know, this, this photo represents, you know, what you will collect through research in a typical design project. And it's not one person's collection, right? This is like, let's say, a, a team of people, sometimes five, ten people collect a lot of information. You're pulling it together and they're organizing it and sorting it out. And then you're able to use it. To be able to use it, you know, you need to kind of make it accessible. And that you do it by sorting categorizing. Uh, so we, we become very good at that. And this is again, something that you will repeat in every design process, or every time you apply the design process in your project courses. And uh, so sense making through, you know, from sifting through large amount of data and information. In, from data, you know, we convert it to information and information becomes wisdom itself, uh, eventually, right? Through insights and, you know, some interesting things that we discover. So sense making is another important skill that you will discover, uh, that you will learn in design school. You will learn to reframe problems because you know the problem as if someone else, you know, if 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 uh, if a common citizen articulates, you know, what is a problem? Like like this cartoon illustrates, right? Okay, the elevator is too slow. So do should we be asking different questions, right? What do we need to fix? Is it the elevator, which is going to take a lot of money and a lot of time, and maybe there are limitations inherent in an elevator to fix? So is it the elevator that we need to fix or the waiting that we need to fix? Right? So how the problem, reframing of the problem makes it a much more innovative as a solution. So this is something that you will learn as a part and parcel of the design process. You will learn to empathize. You will learn to kind of see you're always designing for users, other people in the world. So you need to get very close to the people. This, this getting close, is a it's a repetitive pattern. It's a repeating pattern if you if you observe, right? If you point me at it. So we keep repeating. Uh, we, we keep getting close to things. So here, actually, it's not a pregnant lady. It is a designer playing the role of a pregnant lady to see, you know, what would a pregnant lady face what are the problems that a pregnant lady faces in, in you know the environment that we create through design you can do that by just strapping on a pillow to your stomach right and then you get to empathize so we need to empathize and we need to understand the users firsthand that's why we always observe and learn we don't read about things as much as we observe directly all our learning is you know very very first hand and very personal so you learn to empathize with your user and it's very important as a skill set and we do gain that skill set. 
you will learn a lot of methods as well. It's not always intuitive, the way we design. It's not always, you know. So there are a lot of methods, but our methods are very, very simple methods and yet very powerful methods. Uh, so I've actually, you know, given a link to this book, uh, which is a collection of methods. Sorry, I just, uh, can you still share, see the screen? Yes, yes, it's visible. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I think this is me. Mm -hmm. Just give me a moment, please. Nej? Yeah, no, no, no. yeah, I'm sorry about that, some glitch here. So we learn a lot of methods, uh, uh, very powerful methods, which are very simple to apply, but which uh, encode in them a lot of power. So you will learn a lot of methods. And then we come to the seemingly exciting part of design, the glamorous part of design. But when you come here, you realize that this is not the real glamour. The real glamour is in your abilities, right? In the sharpening your instincts, sharpening your brain, sharpening your creative confidence. But you also learn the language of design. How do you express, you know, the style? How do you use style as an expressive language? Uh, so these three kettles are actually done by the same company, right? but, but by different designers and uh, in different periods of time. And each of them have deep reasons for uh, why they are the way they are. Mm. They are actually driven by uh, ide ideological reasons in most uh, instances and uh, very, very personal reasons. So you don't learn the language of design and how do you kind of you know, use it to kind of, because we and essentially as designers, we create artifacts. Uh, we create artifacts, objects, uh, and, uh, which we release into the world and it starts defining the world for our fellow citizens. Right? So how do we do that? I mean, is it just random? Is it considered? Absolutely, it is considered. And there are reasons for why we do certain things. Uh, because we want to change the world in a way that we think is appropriate, right, in the day. Uh, so the language of design is something that you will learn eventually. You will learn representation, presentation, narration. There's a book I've shared here called Objects you Collect and Draw, Observe, Collect and Draw. Again, we're coming to this magic word called Observe. So this is a very interesting. So, so if you see this postcard on the left side, it is actually a postcard. And it's been actually created by a designer who's an information designer. So she's actually telling us a story with this postcard. And the story she's telling is, She's actually collected in the in one particular week, right? She said goodbye this many number of times, this many number of times that you see. Each each point there, that's like uh, 3, 6, 9, 12, 5, 60, 64 or so 64 times she said goodbye to people in that week. And each time she said that, she said it for a different reason, maybe in a certain different way, maybe she used different words. All that she's actually coded it into just the use of shapes and colors to depict what she did. And there's the story. So you can actually tell the whole story with just abstract uh, images and shapes by using codes, right? So you do learn how to represent present and narrative. I've taken an extreme case, but storytelling is a very important skill set for us designers. And uh, because, you know, whenever we are trying to communicate an idea, a concept, an argument, we always put it in a narrative form. We actually show and tell. We never talk. We don't just write. We always show and, you know, we narrate it from the point in a very first person way, you know, uh, in a very intimate way is how we communicate. And that's, that's why we need to learn storytelling. And that's an amazing skill set, which every, the rest of the world has now discovered that, you know, that's important as well. They all want to learn storytelling as a skill set. Right? 
So that's something that you learn. So this, this postcard is the other side of the postcard. This other one I showed in the previous slide. And these are the codes that she's used to, to code all the different goodbyes she said in a week. I also shared the book. You also please go to her site. It's a very fine, it's a very fascinating site, and she's a very fascinating person. Uh, I, I would even recommend that you try this book. It's a very interesting book to actually go through and understand. Uh, a lot of a lot of things about design, especially elements of design. How do you appropriate these elements to come? You also learn aesthetics, the ability to judge things for its beauty and you know. Beauty, they say, is in the eye of the beholder. They probably try to true to some extent, but the beauty is also an objective thing. It is not subjective, really, because, you know, when something is beautiful, there is agreement on that beauty. And a number of people will say, yes, I agree, it is beautiful. So there is some objectivity to beauty, and we learn the language of beauty and how do you create something beautiful. Uh, because every time we progress and change something, you know, we can't let go of we can't let go of the fact that you know i think probably the you know the our aesthetic sensibility is one of the biggest differentiators between us and uh let's say professions like uh, engineering without aesthetic we probably don't even exist okay, as designers so we learn uh, we learn the language of aesthetics and we acquire the aesthetic sensibility uh see it's very easy to acquire skills it's very easy to even acquire knowledge and terms of principles and methods Sensibilities are a little more uh, difficult to acquire, and the sensibilities are usually acquired through experience and practice and observation and being there, and, you know, or more difficult to acquire. But in design school, you go a long way in acquiring this. You learn about new mediums. Okay, today we have virtualization, and suddenly, you know, the bottom, it felt like the bottom was falling out from under our feet. Because you know we were used to tangibility, we were used to papers and we were used to pencils and pens, and suddenly we have screens and suddenly we have uh, virtual. There's no material anymore to play with, uh, yet it's a material. So how do you how do you play with that medium? How do you deal with that medium? How do you understand that medium? Right. So when I say affordances, the, another word for affordance could an approximation could be possibilities of the medium. So we try to understand possibilities of new medium. Like today, we are going to move on to the world of virtual reality and metaverse, and where you know virtualization is going to come even closer to us. You know, it's not even as distant as through a screen. And um, the three dimensional will be surrounding you. This virtual, the virtual world will now surround you, not be just in front of you. How do we understand that medium? So we understand the affordance of medium by playing with that medium. Please click on this link. It's a very, very interesting project someone's done. It's an installation. And in design, we're always playing with tangibles. Like, you know, we're creating a drawing, we're creating a shape, we're creating a product. But all of them contain intangible things. Uh, and that intangibility is to do with emotion, right? And what, you know, your, your user, the person who confronts your design, you impact his emotion. And that's the intangible aspect of design. And we learn to kind of control and manipulate and, you know, um, at least direct uh, that uh, intangible aspect towards what we want. Uh, so it's not random. It is not the fluke. It is always very, very deliberate in design. And we learn to do that. Again, a very inst interesting installation. Please click it at this uh, is uh, go to the YouTube uh, link of this and you'll understand more of this project. It's basically rain and you can walk into this rain and it will not rain where you are. Uh, just made it very, very simple sensors and you know, sensors your presence and stops, these uh, sprinklers stop sprinkling where you're standing and when you have rain all around you, yet you're not wet and you're having a real out of the world experience, a very, you know, embodied, uh, bodily experience, right? We can create stuff like that. You will learn a lot of conceptual frameworks because design aspires to be more than what it is. Uh, today, you know, we have all these problems in this world, uh, the real wicked problems. Now, how does design rise up to respond to these problems? So you'll be learning. We learn, we learn, we understand design in terms of the definition of design. That's very important for us. So as you advance in your studies, uh, we understand the definition of design. We are probably the only profession in the world where each one has its own definition. 
you ask 10 designers what is design and each one is going to give you a different reason. And we exist with that. And that ambiguity is fine by us. And we can live with that. And it is totally okay. And it is very comfortable to live with that ambiguity. And so you will understand, uh, you will learn a lot of conceptual frameworks that, you know, our own understanding, our definition of frame. Because we are always trying to respond to newer worlds and newer challenges and the future. We are always designing for the future. Did you, do you realize that? You know, we are not, we are never designing for the past. We are always designing something that's for the future. And of course, you know, we do, we do learn, we have to understand because we are designing for a certain community, a world, our environment, and we understand the environment. We have to understand, we have to, we have to be much more alert to our environment. That's why we, I, I was talking about observation, getting close. And it's very, very keen, very, very important uh, skill sets for us designers to cultivate. Um, so you, we will learn about culture, we will learn community and environment, and, how, how the community and you know, the, uh, a certain audience responds to what you do. How do you connect with them? How do you communicate with them? This is a beautiful book I've shared, uh, written by my own professor, Ms. Kumar Weiss. And it's a very, very simple, very easy to understand book. I recommend this book to every, every design aspirant, uh, the, uh, aspiring design student. And very, very importantly, Everything is important, but you know, I mean, every time I come to another slide, it just seems like the most important thing in the world, right? Uh, so we, our knowledge is always in the world. Of course, we also learn through books and you know, people who collect knowledge and put it in a book and we kind of learn through a secondary means of learning. But we, we place a lot of importance and we, play, we place a lot of um, premium on you know, learning firsthand and learning from people who probably know better than us. Suppose, you know, I'm 60 years old and suppose I want to design for children. Right? And, you know, do I do, can I claim that I know better than a child knows? I've been a child, but I've lost it, right? I've lost that context. Now. But if I really want to know what a child thinks about you know, what they want, I still need to get close to the child. And the child actually knows better. So the knowledge is in the world. And then, you know, how do we appropriate that knowledge? That is very fundamental to us and very important for us. And that, this is, again, another thing, another aspect that, you know, differentiates us from a lot of other disciplines. And I come to my final slide. At the end of all these things that you learned, and a lot more, which I haven't actually, you know, put it in my slides. Uh, I would say, you know, there are probably another three times of what I just revealed to you as things that you learn. And the funny thing is you learn all these things without being very conscious about this learning. It's all happening, you know, just by being there and experiencing it through the background of being in a design school. That's, that's the beauty of design school. You don't have to learn through memorizing. You don't have to learn through understanding formulas. You just learn through just, just being there in that environment. That's the beauty. And a lot of things become second nature to us. After you know four, three, four years in school, we learn we learn to reflect. So we pick up these habits, uh, which are very, very important habits. This 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 is actually a framework that was developed by Howard uh, through an experiment. Uh, and you can if you again go through the link here and understand more about it. So you see, you know, you see all these things. We stretch and explore. We always try to look beyond what we're saying. That's the stretch. Or do beyond what we're doing, uh, what we've been asked to do. So that's right. We always express, we learn to express, and we always reflect and we develop. We develop through making. So always make and we never think, we just don't sit in a corner and think. It's always, you know, that's again the knowledge in the world, right? Making is the knowledge in the world. By making something, you're understanding that thing better. So we develop craft, we think, we imagine a lot. So all these things become second nature to us. So we become a rounded individual. Uh, in a very, very different kind of rounded individual uh, where our brains have changed essentially and uh, we understand things in a very different way, we express things in a very different way and that is what we bring to the world at last. And that's the beauty of design and, uh, and, uh, and you're fortunate, you're fortunate I think to realize that design is something that you want to do 
and uh, yeah, I hope uh, that's, that's more or less what my presentation is about. I've just summed up everything. I put the plus sign there to say this is not the limit. It is actually a lot more over and beyond that. I've just tried to show you, I mean, give you a little perspective or show you a small little viewpoint about uh, what design is about. A lot more than, you know, what we start by thinking what design is about. Even me, when I started design, I thought it was all about shape and beauty and sculpting things and all that because I'm a product designer. And then you learn it's actually a lot more. It's actually an attitude and it's and it becomes a lifestyle and you know it becomes a part of your life. It's not even a profession, it's a calling. That's the interesting part of design. And with that, I will uh, stop going. Thanks. All right. I think that was an absolutely amazing immersive experience of what design is. You know, I love the way you went right from the fundamentals and into so much of detail and the variation. It was tremendous. All right. Um, so for the audience who uh, who've been watching, there's quite a few people who are watching. So if you enjoyed that part of the presentation, please click the like button. It makes, um, it encourages all of us here. Um, but, and now's your time to also ask your questions and I will moderate the questions in. Having said that, um, you know, there's always a lot, a question that we get a lot, asked a lot, which is what is the difference between art and design? All right. And, um, and, and, you know, I, I bring this up because we have uh, people who who come to us and said, you know what, the art teacher is teaching them so much in this school and it's so beautiful, the output, and here you're just making a scribble, right? This doesn't look great. So, so from a perception point or a, from a, from a pair, parent point or, or, or someone who doesn't really understand design so much, they see, oh, this is so beautiful and this is not so beautiful, right? Um, so how do you differentiate between the two or how do you probably merge the two? Yeah. There's a fundamental difference uh, between art and design, which is, uh, like I said, engineering is prescriptive, right? They tell you this is the way you do it. It's very formulaic. Art, on the other hand, is other extreme. It's very idiosyncratic which is, you know, I can do anything and call it art. I can put a pen on a table and say, that's, that's art, right? It is very idiosyncratic. Uh, whereas design is somewhere in between. It is descriptive because we have, we have a purpose to what we do, a very, very specific purpose, uh, different from the purpose of art. Art has its own purpose, but our purpose is in the world in the objects that we use. Our purpose is in the day-to-day -day rather than in a, let's say, a, a spiritual realm or you know, in terms of you know, philosophical realm, which is what art is, right? Because art is just preoccupied with beauty for its own sake. For us, you know, it is beauty. We want to integrate beauty into our day-to-day, -day, the way we live, a coffee cup, the way we drink from a cup, and the cup itself, when we place it after drinking that cup, it still has to be beautiful in our mind. It has to be beautiful to use. It has to be beautiful to see. And it has to be beautiful to... It also performs beautifully in its own right. So that way, you know, design, we have different reasons for creating beauty. That's That, that I think is the, different, uh, the difference between design and art. All right. All right. Very interesting. So we have a comment from Mr. Baskar, um, who's, who's a parent. And he says, thanks a lot. The details are very educative and provides insights of design in 30 minutes uh, for someone who's never been part of organized design. All right. So good comment there. Right. Um, now, if you if you go into one of the first slides that you showed, which is this, you know, the hand-eye coordination, right? Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, when it comes to this, right? This seems to be one of the first few principles of design that you that you've covered. Um, this aspect of the dark lines, the light lines, the scribbling. How important is this 
from a fundamental aspect for all designers, say a, a professional design, for example, you were at Infosys, right? So how important is something like this in a professional environment? See, for designers, you know, the idea of drawing, the reason we draw is not to express or represent, but to explore an idea. And there's nothing faster than, you know, pencil and paper to, because the, to capture thought at the speed of thought, there's nothing that has come close to paper and pencil. And we, and in design schools, some design schools, at least you would find that there's a lot of stress and thrust on drawing because we believe in the, you know, the utility of this and the importance of this. And first thing we need to do is to eliminate this barrier, right? That we've all kind of, you know, that we cannot draw. Nobody told us, you know, if you ask an eight-year-old, you know, can you draw? Yeah, you know, nobody's going to say, no, I can't draw. And over the course of, uh, of our education, you know, they put a right and wrong frames to it. And then they said, if you do this, you can draw. And if you do that, you cannot draw. But we are drawing for our, our own needs. I draw for myself because, you know, it helps me idea. It helps me think. That's the first reason why we learn. And the second reason is, of course, we represent and we can communicate better. And to communicate visually is, you know, very, very important and it's much better. And today we're realizing when we're dealing with, let's say, very complex, uh, big data, a lot of data, right? And how do we consolidate it into, you know, very, very consumable consolidations for people to understand large amounts of data? You go and, uh, you know, you go and get the information designer to design and compile it uh, in a visual form. So the visual form is important for us because that's how we, that's that's a playing field, but that is also the way, our medium of communication. And we can communicate much better with, you know, what picture speaks a thousand words. It's very true. Do you realize that it's a very, very true thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so Basket has another question who says, in this era of digital design, what is the significance of design by hand on paper? Why can't everything move to digital? You can today, you have digital equivalents of paper. You can buy uh, screens like Cintiq and, you know, or even an iPad. And, you know, you have, you have almost a, a very tactile simulation of paper happening. Um, yeah, you can. You can. Uh, a lot of people use it and a lot of designers progress to that because, you know, it records better and, you know, you can store better and uh, you can retrieve it better. Uh, so I'm not saying no to digitizing. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not actually creating a material orthodoxy here, but I think the idea of drawing is still very, very important. Right. And on the other hand, on the other hand, when you use, we also have to learn the digital way. Because, you know, that is also something that we, in today, we are forced to intensively use to communicate or create, right? Uh, most of our tools of creation today are uh, in the digital uh, uh, medium. Uh, if you want to, uh, you want to create an illustration, you want to create an artwork, a logo, if you want to design a book, you even want to design an object, you're always doing it in the digital medium. So having said that, you have the beginnings here, but even when you come to the digital media, right? You're, you're creating perspectives, you're creating proportions, you're creating relationships between things. All these relationships still need to be understood. And this is best understood by drawing, because you know when you're drawing, you're employing a body. Today, see, the brain is not the dominant organ in our, in our uh, we, till now, you know, we were thinking, you know, our brain controls everything. Brain is number one and body reports to the brain. It doesn't. Brain and body actually work in tandem. That these are the new models of cognitive science that have been, uh, you know, being developed. Um, and so we know that, you know, the brain has as much, a, the body has as much of a function to perform in thinking and, you know, reasoning as the brain does. Uh, so to employ the body in the learning of this coordination, right? The seeing, the observing, the building those relationships, right? To employ the body is an embodied way of learning. And today, a lot of studies are coming back and saying, yes, employ the body. You know, I mean, teachers are being now trained 
to kind of, you know, how do you teach children to learn in a more embodied way? Uh, so I would still, I would still say paper and pen can still, uh, still has an edge over these digital uh, objects because they are versatile, but they also impose some limitations, right? The way you hold it, the way you carry it. I can put the paper on a table, I can put it on the ground. I, you know, in fact, this gestural drawing, what you're saying here is usually done to scale. Scale of the student. Suppose you're a four feet tall student, you're actually drawing it in four feet long. That is, that is one particular course where you're doing gest gestural drawing, and then you're doing a drawing which is to scale with yourself. You're looking at yourself in a mirror and drawing your own scale. So yeah, you can't you can't do that in a digital space. At least till now, no, at least not yet. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so Bhaskar says thanks. You answered my question. Next question, if you can take it to the slide of the pregnant girl. Yeah, this one. So uh, Mrithika's question is about empathy. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the amazing lecture. I do have a question. How do you empathize? I've been trying to find problems around me to solve, but nothing seems to pop up. What can I do? Yeah, I'll give you a very small trick. Uh, see, this is something that we have to cultivate. It's a sensibility. Like I said, right, in design, we learn some skills. The skills are actually the easiest. A lot of aspiring you know, design students think skills is what they're going to design schools to learn. No, that's all done in the first six months, uh, first four months, and it's over with. Skills are actually the easiest thing. And of course, you gain knowledge throughout. And you, know, you, you learn to learn rather than memorize. We learn the sources of knowledge rather than you know, you know, carry it all in your head. But then sensibilities are the more hard, the more difficult things to learn, like I mentioned, right? Like aesthetic sense. Empathizing is a sensibility as well. Okay. So how do how do you how does one come to this confidence state where you understand the other person, right? You're confronting the other person, and then you know you read him. Of course, first you also have to train your mind attitudinally, right? Because you know you need to be more critical, you need to remove a lot of biases and prejudices we carry. All those things are opened up. But end of the day, we are also, you know, we connect, we observe, and we know we can, we take very small signals that come from people towards us. So it, it's a sensibility that has to be acquired through repeated practice and experience. So it's gonna take a while. So don't don't worry about it and don't despair. But I will give you a very simple technique or a method that you can follow to at least sharpen your instincts about, you know, uh, empathizing for them. So there is something called an empathy map. Okay, you can just Google it. You'll find it's a very, very, very simple template. It's a very simple canvas. It's called the empathy map. So it just asks you to ask yourself when you're observing something, right? It just asks you to ask yourself a few questions. So what is the user doing? What is the user thinking? What is the user feeling, right? They ask you to ask yourself the few questions of that nature and then write it down. So very, very, it is a tool that we use in the, yeah. It's again, like I said, all our tools are very, very simple, but yet very, very powerful because it gets you to the sympathetic state, which is a very hard thing to actually get to. Uh, people spend, you know, like, a lot of time, I know you're talking about you know, you meditate and you know, spiritualists, they're all empathy is a big thing, right? How do you get, how do you bridge the distance? Uh, but yeah, this is a very simple technique you can uh, use, but it is going to take a while uh, to understand. Right. That's, that's great. Um, so the other aspect that a lot of you know, uh, students struggle oh, struggle with is ideation, right? Generation of ideas. How does one, I, I mean, there's probably a build up on to Mritika's question, right? Because there's a constraint there. One is empathy, but then is also generating ideas. So how do they, you go about generating ideas? How ideas come actually is a mystery even in neuroscience, okay? 
I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to fight you all a little bit <laughs> before I tell you. Actually, it's not so difficult. Uh, but it is still a mystery, right? We still don't know. Nobody's cracked or at least found out, you know, where do I guess? Because it does not come from the conscious brain. You're good, you're in a way, your creative ideas actually spring from the unconscious. The subconscious, not the unconscious, subconscious, I mean, so, uh, from the subconscious brain. But the subconscious brain will not give you an idea till the conscious brain forces it to give, the, give, it, give, give you that idea. So herein lies the paradox, right? So you have to employ the conscious brain, but then ultimately the answer comes from the subconscious brain. So we again use a number of methods, okay? In the beginning, we will use very, very simple uh, methods and tricks and um, ways of doing it, uh, to force creativity. So once you force creativity, then the brain begins to think and work in that manner. And the brain reconfigures to work in that manner, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, that's how it happens. So we, there are some very simple tricks that you will learn, but eventually brain itself becomes creative by nature. Uh, that's the interesting part. That's the very interesting part. Of it. All right. Um, right. So, so uh, Rima, if you are available, a couple of questions for you. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Rima, when would the, the applications for RV University, when is it expected? Uh, so October, mid of October, we are planning to start our applications and we will be updating it on our website. All right, all right, all right. And um, um, right, so that's pretty much it for now. And we're almost done with this webinar. All right, so um, Professor Sudhakar, thank you so much. It's been very insightful, and my uh, pleasure, Mike. And as you were, uh, you know, showing each slide and and showing us the the links, what I've done is I've put those links in the description of this webinar. So anyone who would like to go through this again, go through the links. It's in the description of the webinar. I've also posted in the chat. So. Um, I think this tremendous learning from, from each of these links, I was going, as I was posting them, I was going through them, just tremendous learning in that. Uh, so definitely please go through all that um, and do your best to go through as much as possible. It's been a lovely presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. It was always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, students as planning to design because like we are all are, you know, as designers, we are very passionate about what we do. So. Absolutely. Uh, and Rima, thank you for being here as well. And, uh, it be good. Yeah. Go on, go on. Yeah. If there's anything that you'd yeah. like to add. Yeah, students can start connecting us or visit our website from October 2nd week onwards. Uh, so there is a change in process of admission this year. So we will be updating so that they can uh, prepare well in advance and get in touch with us. All right. And um, I've also in the chat box, I've also pinned uh, the link to the DQH listing of RV University. So RV University is listed on DQH is one of the top universities in India to consider. Um, you can click on that, you go to the DQH listing. We don't have the application uh, link yet. So as soon as we get the application link, we'll up update it there. And we'll also inform you on the groups. Uh, thanks once again, and uh, if you've enjoyed this webinar, please remember to click the like button and also subscribe to the DQ Labs YouTube channel. Right? Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, and and uh, Rima, if you all can.